Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, just like to start with a land acknowledgement uh, before we begin. Uh, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, so too Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and Nakota Sioux. We encourage everyone to watch uh, that is watching to reflect on the territory, treaties, and people where you live and work. Uh, this webinar is part of the Edmonton Hydrogen Hubs webinar series on building a low carbon hydrogen economy in the Edmonton region. These monthly conversations are meant to provide industry, government, and investors with the knowledge and tools they need to take advantage of the Edmonton region's potential for low cost, low carbon hydrogen, and to contribute to the development of this new energy system. Uh, I'm Tom McCaffrey, the Executive Director for Policy Engagement with Emissions Reduction Alberta. Uh, ERA is one of the investors in the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and a major supporter of the work that is being done by all the hub partners. Uh, the hub has been a critically important connecting point. Uh, in my opinion, the hub is a case study for how hubs and clustering should be done. Uh, it's a tactic that governments have often deployed, but I've not seen one work as well as the Edmonton Hydrogen Hub has. It's truly been a game changer. Uh, the Alberta government and federal government should be incredibly uh, proud of this investment and should lean in to understand how uh, it is achieving the incredible results that it actually is. The leadership shown by the Transition Accelerator, Edmonton Global, Heartland, Sturgeon County, and many more is the reason we find ourselves at a pace slightly ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to developing a hydrogen economy. And this is a race, and make no mistake, everyone around the world is racing. Uh, Canada has lost these races before. Our global partners are fierce competitors, and Canada has all the expertise the world needs to achieve net zero. But without a roadmap, the talents and companies that will solve the world's net zero challenges will go elsewhere. Without a strategy, we will lose this race. Uh, hydrogen is only one key element in the net zero future. Uh, so many other opportunities exist and may get missed if we do not follow the leadership and the model of the Edmonton Region Hub. Uh, many other key success factors in many other subsectors of the clean economy need to be developed in parallel. Thousands of key success factors need to be identified and then achieved. But first, we must identify the vision. We must write the industrial strategy and policy. That will show us the way. Uh, this is a policy that knits together the many great things that are already happening and sets the stage for industry to rally around. And that's where today's conversation will take us. As I said, this is a race. Uh, other jurisdictions have written or are writing industrial policy. And we have many advantages in Canada, one being our energy fo focused workforce in Alberta. Uh, and that kind of leads us to uh, our guest today and to explore this issue. I'm pleased to introduce Bentley Allen, a research director at the Transition Accelerator, as well as an associate professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Allen is an award-winning scholar who has written on the dynamics of international order, science and politics, climate policy, and the political economy of decarbonization. His recent reports for the Transition Accelerator include Canada's future in a net zero world and a roadmap for Canada's battery value chain along with co-organizing the recent Net Zero Industrial Strategy Summit in Ottawa, which I actually attended. Uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them later in the webinar. Uh, please use the Q&A box for questions only rather than a chat box, as this helps everything uh, keep everything in one place. And if you like someone's question, feel free to, uh, I think you can vote for it. It says upvote, I'm not quite sure what that means, but. Uh, it will help us determine the order the questions will be addressed. And so uh, over to you, Bentley. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the summit because the, the presentation that I'll give today uh, is the presentation uh, that I gave at the summit. And I just wanna say um, that it's it was a collaborative effort. I worked closely with uh, Professor Charles Sable, who's a, a very uh, famous and, and illustrative um, professor at Columbia University, one of the world's foremost experts on industrial strategy and also on clusters, the very idea of an industrial development cluster. Chuck was one of the foremost authors of um, in his work in the 1980s on the second industrial divide. 
Um, and then in addition, um, I work very closely with James Meadowcroft, my colleague at the Accelerator, and I work very closely with uh, Derek Eaton at the Smart Prosperity Institute. Um, and they were um, close collaborators on the summit and, and on all this work uh, that I do uh, through the Accelerator. So I'm just gonna do something a little bit different, I think for the hub um, uh, than, than you normally see in the hub, and that's talk about industrial strategy, mostly at the federal level. Um, but I think a lot of the themes that you're going to uh, hear today are gonna be really familiar to the folks who've been participating actively uh, in the hub, because I really agree with what Tom said about how the hub is a case study it's not just a case study about how to do, you know, regional place-based uh, industrial development well, but it's an, it's a case study about how we can successfully collaborate across the public and private um, divide to to do industrial strategy, and that's the theme of today's call of, of today's um, presentation. So let's just start with some definitions. Uh, what is industrial policy? So it's really any set of measures that is intended to create, build, or shape industry. And it's critical here that it's not actually tied to specific tools. There's this conception of industrial policy, which I, I think of as like the old industrial policy, that it has to be protectionist and nationalist in order to count as industrial policy. There's, of course, also the famous cases of import substitution, where Japan and Korea specifically targeted sectors of technologies that they were importing and sought to build up domestic industries in those particular areas. Um, but we're now talking about uh, something very different. We're talking about modern industrial strategy, which so often, so for our Nordic counterparts, is export oriented, which is that it's not protectionist. It's actually, we're trying to take a, take a part in the global economy. Um, and in order to be uh, taking part in the global economy, it needs to have a competitiveness lens. So we're really talking about future competitiveness in addition to uh, building up homegrown capacity and homegrown industries. Um, so that we have certain domestic cap capacities. Um, net zero industrial strategy kind of enters into this moment where modern industrial policy has already been up and running for a long time um, as a really successful way in order to create the industries and the technologies that we need to accelerate decarbonization. And the logic of net zero industrial policy is a little bit different than the typical conversation that we have in climate policy, which is about mitigation and is therefore focused on greenhouse gas reductions. Instead, net zero industrial policy is really about seizing economic opportunity. It's about finding opportunities in a particular jurisdiction, figuring out a strategy, as Tom said, about how we're gonna grab and build those opportunities um, and going from there. But you have to do that in a global competitive landscape because it's not gonna be possible to, to just be a small closed economy for a country like Canada. We've got to be open, and therefore we have to be smart about the way that we're doing industrial policy. We have to do it in a modern way where we align investment and regulation in order to activate these supply chains uh, in order to accelerate decarbonization. So net zero industrial policy is really taking off. Almost all of Canada's major trading partners and competitors are effectively deploying strategic approaches. This really started with China in the 1990s with major pushes on EVs. Or, well, they started with wind and solar and then moved into batteries and EVs. And the headline of the Globe and Mail today is, is basically economic espionage, whereby uh, you know, Chinese intelligence was, was basically getting IP from Hydro-Quebec, which was, you know, is, is a really major player in the lithium iron phosphate uh, technology ecosystem and an important piece of a potential Canadian industrial strategy which we could talk more about, uh, especially the role of Hydro Quebec. Um, but China really started this in the 1990s. And then there were reactions from the United States and, and Europe to try to recapture some of those supply chains that were being very actively stolen by Chinese industrial strategy. And in 2018, Europe launched the battery and hydrogen alliances, which are really interesting from a Canadian perspective, because you can think of the European Commission as kind of being an analog to a weak federal government we have lots of member states, or in our case, provinces, that have to be corralled and organized into a coherent strategy. And the way they did that was working closely with an independent organization called Inno Energy, which served this role as an independent intermediary between the public and private, helped to set strategy, and now is working to help execute the project pipeline that's associated with it. Uh, Australia has hydrogen clusters. Um, it also has a technology roadmap, which is really targeting the exact same segments of, of the net zero economy that Canada would like to be positioned in, uh, critical minerals, uh, green steel, CCUS, hydrogen. Australia is coming for the same 
for the same potential areas that Canada wants to grab global market share in. Uh, the UK has had a really successful uh, deployment of offshore wind through its wind strategy, and it's now kickstarting kick a CCUS strategy, trying to mobilize uh, its legacy industries in oil and gas around that in the North Sea. Uh, South Korea, which in the 1970s is one of the original case studies of, of what a really amazing, successful industrial strategy looks like. And just to think about that, you know, we just subsidized LG to set up here in Canada. So we're taking a beneficiary of South Korean industrial policy, and we're now subsidizing them to, to, uh, to do direct investment uh, here in Canada. Um, but they also have, a, they're rolling out uh, all kinds of, of new initiatives on top of their uh, already existing very strong industrial policy, which has really strongly positioned South Korean firms in renewable supply chains and in uh, EV and battery supply chains. Um, they have the engineering and the, and the technical skills that all industries in the energy transition need. And so they're really strongly positioned. And finally, of course, the elephant uh, on the continent is, is the new uh, US industrial strategy. The, the Biden administration unapologetically now uses uh, the term national industrial strategy. That is the term that they use to describe what it is that they are doing, uh, both through the IRA and through the Department of Energy. So it's really crucial to look at what's in the IRA. There's both big cash investments. There's a big expansion of the loan authority for the loan program under the Department of Energy. And there's the tax credits, which have been getting a lot of um, media attention. Those all provide um, a really strong uh, you know, activation, a really strong demand and supply signal to each of these sectors. Um, they're going to drive lots and lots of investment. Um, but also missed is often that there are these Department of Energy roadmaps that are done in every sector. So they have an industrial decarbonization roadmap for chemicals and steel and cement and aluminum. They have a critical minerals roadmap. They have a battery roadmap. They just a couple of weeks ago released the SAF Grand Challenge, which is a roadmap for sustainable aviation fuel. And these roadmaps are helping to organize the private sector and the government so they can collaborate on using the IRA incentives in order to actually activate, deploy, and reach net zero, um, uh, as well as capturing, recapturing um, segments of these global supply chains, localizing them in America, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very clearly industrial strategy. It even has some of that protectionist flavor that I talked about as being part of the classical old industrial policy, but it also has a lot of uh, flavor of the new uh, modern industrial policy, which is really built on strategic collaboration with industry. So that landscape uh, creates something that's really highly competitive, as Tom said. And what it means is that the supply chains in each of these high priority opportunity areas are really, um, are really going to form really quickly. And so Canada kind of needs to act. I just want to take one moment and kind of unpack one of the strategies that I just mentioned to kind of show you how the pieces fit together at a national level. So first, uh, a key element of strong industrial strategy is targets. And here we're talking about not emissions reductions targets, but deployment metrics. We're going to deploy 50, megawatt, 50 gigawatts of, of uh, offshore wind by 2030. That was the initial the, actually, the initial UK strategy was 40 gigawatts, and it was so successful, they could up it to 50 gigawatts. Um, so they could basically increase their, their target by 25%. And you see this a lot in the energy transition, where deployment is actually outpacing everybody's you know, reasonable and ambitious expectations. The second is that there's strong public-private collaboration, this exchange between the government and industry through the Offshore Wind Industry Council that meets, uh, st talks about projects, talks about regulations, citing challenges, it, it works on everything, um, um, but it also uh, really makes sure that there's alignment between the government and industry. And then there's a variety of policy tools, and it's really important to think about these policy tools as unfolding across the whole supply chain. And these S's and D's refer to whether or not the policy is a supply side policy, whether it's really promoting the production of, of uh, wind energy, or whether it's really talking about the demand side, which is you know creating that market for the product in the first place. So you want to make sure in any industrial policy that you're aligning supply and demand, sequencing them appropriately, and that you have policies and programs that allow you to uh, align supply push with demand pull uh, policy initiatives. And finally, the, the, the UK wind strategy also gets really good independent advice from this organization called the Crown Estate, which owns the offshore uh, uh, shelf. It has the legal rights to the offshore shelf. And the Crown State like takes care of Buckingham Palace and, and things like that, but it had business development and, and business acumen. And so it was kind of just sitting there and it, it was almost by accident that it got used as this really excellent place where they could do deep analysis 
and build up some expertise, hire some experts, um, and provide the government with really good independent advice for how to do the wind strategy in a smart way, and thereby provide a counterbalance to the industry council, which is, of course, dominated by industry interests and industry voices. And this is crucial to getting industrial strategy right, that you're combining industry voices with expert voices in a certain way so that you're actually making good and strong investments. And there's, of course, competition um, as well kind of built into this. This is the modern and industrial part of it. It's not a top-down planned strategy, right? There are leasing rounds where firms have to bring their applications and make bids um, and then receive support through the contract for difference policy program on, on those successful bids. Um, and that competition, building that in is really crucial, I think, to really understanding how to do a good industrial strategy. So that's what industrial strategy is and how it works in other places. Now, of course, we actually have a long tradition of Canadian industrial strategy. Um, all of the major industries in Canada have been built on it. In Alberta specifically, I think of Aostra as being an excellent example of, a, of an industrial strategy where there was a big public-private partnership, it was actually a, a Crown Corp, um, was deployed and experimented and did demonstrations for technologies that were coming out of the university in order to unlock uh, the oil sand. So there's really, tangible good experience with industrial strategy right there in Alberta, but also in Ontario and BC and in course Quebec has been a great recent example really driving successful uh, foreign investment in an EV supply chain. Um, specifically with Beconcourt looking a lot like Alberta industrial heartland as like a real place where we're going to build the net zero transition in these places. Um, looking really strong in that particular way and then of course we have federal pieces as well. So it's really not whether we're going to have an industrial strategy, but it's whether we're going to have a smart and net zero industrial strategy here in Canada. Um, and this idea that we don't do this or we don't pick winners, it's just not borne out by the evidence. We do this constantly and we do it all the time. And so the question is whether or not we're going to do that in a smart way or whether we're going to do it in a way where, um, uh, you know, we're wasting public money and we're not positioning ourselves strategically in global industries. So, um, the good news is we've got lots of opportunities. Uh, this is the export table. We have to really pay attention to what happens as fossil fuel energy products declines as a share of exports. But the good news is we have really strong export potential in vehicles, in mining, in forestry, in agriculture, uh, in industrial machinery, chemicals, uh, and aerospace. So we have really strong industries that are all going to go through a transition right now. And we have strong industries there. So we have the industrial and the resource base to do really strong industrial strategy. Now, the first report that Tom mentioned, Canada's future in a net zero world, identified seven priority areas where we need to create sector strategies. Um, and these are those critical areas. So I don't think any of them will be a big surprise to, to the folks on the call. Um, but we also need to think across them at the systemic level to these critical enablers of the downstream industries. So we need clean power and critical minerals, biomass and green transportation corridors. And we need all those to be done right so that these downstream markets, as they go out there and try to build up capacity and create foreign markets for their products, that they have access to low carbon, cheap inputs. And so these are these structural enablers across the top that provide the basis for these strong downstream markets. And sometimes it's hard to choose an industrial strategy where to focus. But this vision that is on the slide right now, I think provides us with a way where we're, we can clearly build focus in these downstream areas that have clear markets, while at the same time activating the best pieces of those upstream elements to, to provide infrastructural support for them. But at the same time, we have to look across the sectors at the same time. We can't just dive into each individual sector. So why is that the case? Well, let's just think about the role of critical minerals. So we want critical minerals to be heading into batteries for light duty and medium duty electric trucks. The best bets in the net zero transition are that these seg segments are going to be fully electric. And the latest evidence coming out of experiments in trucking uh, actually suggests that heavy duty freight on electric might be, uh, might be more efficient from a thermodynamic perspective. But as soon as you start to look at the critical minerals picture, you realize that actually heavy duty freight trucks require a lot of nickel. And in the report that I did with the Battery Metals Association of Canada, Accelerate and our partners at the Energy Futures Lab, um, that report uh, found that actually we would need double the amount of nickel if we wanted to decarbonize freight in addition to the rest of the passenger fleet. And that amount of nickel is just not there, at least not without relying on shaky geopolitical 
uh, supply chains, basically supply chains controlled by Russia and China through China's investments in Indonesia's nickel feed. So what we actually probably need to do is make sure that hydrogen is going into heavy duty freight trucks. Now this is just a, for the folks on this call, this is just a different argument maybe for the same thing that you already know, which is that, um, you know, freight trucking and busing are excellent downstream markets for hydrogen and we need to scale those in order to provide hydrogen markets. Um, but this is how it emerges from an industrial strategy analysis in addition to the kind of local uh, techno-economic and, and economic opportunity analysis that motivated the hub. But the problem right now at the federal level is that federal policy is actually driving biofuels into heavy duty freight trucks instead of hydrogen through the clean fuels regulation, which is incentivizing the creation of renewable diesel. Now, the problem with that is that actually it would probably be better from a strategic planning perspective to make sure that biomass was heading into sustainable aviation fuel because sustainable aviation fuel doesn't, aviation doesn't have other alternative decarbonization options. Its best decarbonization option is biofuels as a drop-in. So we have a policy framework that is not actually aligned with the resource constraints that we have or what a net zero pathway would actually look like. In fact, our policy framework is delaying the expenditure on hydrogen capital that we would need in order to actually decarbonize freight trucking for the long run. And it's making it harder for us to produce the SAF that we need to decarbonize aviation in the near and medium term. These are the kinds of insights that you get as soon as you start to do sector strategies individually, and then you step back up to the system level to try to map across them. And that's exactly what an industrial strategy is for. It's for thinking deeply about strategy in the sectors and to think critically about the national resource space, its place in the world, and how we're going to activate um, opportunities in multiple sectors at the same time. Now, we have a lot of programs in Canada. We even have a lot of investments. But the problem when you talk to industry again and again is that these programs are largely passive. They don't give a clear sense of where we're going or what success looks like. Um, and the collaborations between government and industry in hydrogen and in other areas are often really flat. The government has not shown itself to be a strong convener or, or someone who can um, deliver on, on an industrial strategy on its own. So look at, the, look at the economic strategy tables or the industrial strategy council. You know, they outsource that contract to McKinsey, which then delivered a report, but there was no there was no project pipeline that came out of that. We just got reports instead of an actual uh, collaborative industrial strategy. So how can Canada take a more strategic approach? How can it learn from international best practices in order to drive industrial strategy? The first piece is just to set net zero competitiveness goals. Now, these would be clear and bold targets that can help to focus industry and catalyze action. Goals here would refer to quantitative economic targets, not abstract targets, not uh, modeling artifacts or emissions reductions targets, but real things that need to happen in order to achieve net zero. How many SAF plants do we need? What, how many gigawatt hours of batteries are we going to produce? We need to look at the net zero pathways that we have on the table. We need to look at the greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we want to achieve and think about concrete physical analogs to those and set those as targets. And those targets need to be indexed both to existing net zero targets or net zero pathways, but also to competitiveness in a global frame. We have to benchmark ourselves to a vision of Canada in the world in 2030 and 2050. What kind of country do we want Canada to be in the 2050 global economy? We need to have that vision. It needs to be really clear and we need to get to work on it right now. And this is just to say that you know all of the major industrial strategies that I mentioned earlier are, are rooted in quantitative economic deployment or price targets. Um, I could talk more about targets. I could talk all day about targets, well, how to do them, what they look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. The second key message is we have to build strategic collaborations. And here, I think the real key opportunity in Canada is to make those collaborations broad, to make sure that there's broad buy-in from Indigenous communities, labor, and finance, because we need to mobilize uh, private capital as well as Indigenous capital. Um, and we need labor to be on board so that we can do skills development in a concrete and strategic way. So we have to really work together to create strategies and goals. We can't just have the government hand them down and, and expect everybody to meet them. But in order to do that, you actually need to work with independent intermediaries you need to work with organizations like the accelerator in the hub or like InnoEnergy 
in EU energy because they can catalyze this exchange of information between government and industry that otherwise wouldn't happen because when industry is talking to its regulator, it won't say everything. <laughs> and when a regulator is talking to industry, it won't say everything. You need that inter independent intermediary, not just to provide deep expertise and analytics and, and provide a source of, of activity, focus and motion, um, but to provide each side with a trusted partner that they can actually work with. Um, so that independent advice really is important to making smart investments through an industrial strategy, to getting the regulatory picture right, um, and those kinds of things. Information flows is really critical to good industrial strategy. Then you need to take those strategic collaborations and those goals and say, okay, what are the critical actions, investments, and regulatory changes that we need in order to achieve the goals? And what we're trying to do here is not just achieve the targets as targets, but to build up homegrown capacity in these firms so that it's Canadian firms that are scaling. And this will help us to um, really address some of the structural weaknesses in the Canadian economy that have really negatively uh, uh, impacted us, such as our inability to scale our own firms. Um, what that ultimately means is that we have very low levels of investment in R&D because, and therefore no ability to create innovation ecosystems because all the firms that dominate investment here locate their R&D back in their national headquarters, whether that's in Switzerland or in Germany or in the United States, uh, it's not located here. So we need to scale our own firms so that our R&D, that is our innovation capacity is located here in Canada and that we can produce the intellectual property, the spillovers, the knowledge and the skills in order to compete over a long transition with lots of technological uncertainty. And these sector strategies also have to take a whole value chain approach. And this is, I don't need to explain this to the hub audience because this is what the hub does. It takes a whole value chain approach. It aligns supply and demand and tries to activate them both at the same time, sequence them appropriately. And that's absolutely critical to industrial strategy and why the hub is a really excellent example of industrial strategy. And then we need to use international best practices to structure ongoing deliberations and continue to foster learning. And I won't get too much into that. But basically what we need in every sector is a table where industry, finance, uh, indigenous folks uh, and labor can come together with government. Um, and then we need that project development and research hub like the Accelerator uh, and its partners in the, in the hub uh, provide. And we need this in every sector. And this is not just a vision that uh, is extrapolating from the work you've done in Edmonton, um, but what I find so fascinating is that the work you've done in Edmonton really fits really well with what the top recommendations from international best practices on industrial strategy say you need to do. Um, and there are strong analogs between what is happening um, in the hydrogen hub and what Germany does in various industries through Fraunhofer and its, and its industrial alliances, what the UK does in aerospace and, and, and what we do in, in lots of other international case studies. And then finally, we want to use those goals to make sure that we're aligning investment and guiding policy. We want to make sure that the goals and the strategies are actually informing our project development. So today, uh, Minister Wilkinson announced 800 million in spending from a clean fuels fund. And I just do not understand why that 800 million was not indexed to a clear strategy for clean fuels in this country. Um, in the UK, for example, in the aerospace strategy, you know, they created a $4 billion fund for aerospace growth, the growth partnership. They put together a sector table. The minister sat at the table with their best advisors. And then there was Innovate UK there as an independent agency to inform the strategy and hold the pen on the project development, an independent crown corp, called like Iostra. Um, and the three of them made a, made a strategy and the pot of money was used to execute the strategy. But instead we have passive application systems set up in government program after government program. And then those goals and strategies are not being used to underwrite that. So we have a hydrogen strategy and it's over there. And I'm sure you could find some recommendations in the hydrogen strategy that were on that list of clean fuel spending today, uh, but it was not a highly integrated coherent approach that was taken in order to, to use that money um, uh, coherently and actively. Um, so that we need small funds that are attached to the sectors that they can employ. And then there are larger funds in the SIF and in the Canadian Growth Fund um, that can also be, be activated. And that kind of gives us this image where we have um, the tables, the hubs, and the government working together to inform um, the sector-specific fund that they have. This would be the Clean Fuels Fund, but also have bump-up funds that are available. And then you want to make sure that aligned 
uh, that regulations and supporting programs are strongly aligned by that, and that you're thinking about global competitiveness and, and all kinds of other things uh, at the same time at these at these strategy tables. Um, so again, and I use the case of the hydrogen economy as a way to explain this in other sectors, um, where what you really need to do is think strongly about aligning supply push policies with demand pull policy. So at the national level now, um, there I was really heartened to see a 40% hydrogen tax credit. When the government had initially indicated that it was going to be up to 30%, I was glad to see them go over that. Because even a 40% ITC doesn't come anywhere close to matching the $3 a kilogram under the IRA. Now, we also have some bump from carbon pricing and potentially from the CFR. But the question is, does that match the three kilograms? We need, this, we need the analytics for this like now, like yesterday, like August 25th, the day after the IRA announcement came out. Like we need it then, and, and we need that to inform the budget. And so uh, the, the accelerator is, is trying to push forward this work. Um, uh, with the government. But then at the same time, we also need down, to downstream pull so that that hydrogen that gets produced has a place to go. And uh, it won't surprise anybody in this audience that that the downstream investments that we really need to focus on are, are steel, where the, the AMD facility in Hamilton is going to be ready for hydrogen uh, in ammonia, where uh, basically uh, hot, you know blue or green hydrogen is a drop-in for gray or black hydrogen and therefore is delivering carbon intensity reductions right away uh, without any technological change or very little technological change. Um, and then there's biofuels uh, and heavy duty trucks, of course, as really strong downstream, downstream markets. And so just as a sketch at the national level, we could just set that out. We could just set out 20, 30 targets. These are just postulated, you know, 20% of Canadian steel, that would be that whole AMD facility. That's 250,000 tons of hydrogen that would be needed. Uh, if we did 50% of the ammonia demand, that'd be about 700,000. That's something that would be ambitious, but we could do it. Um, and the amount of uh, hydrogen that we would need for a 10% SAF target, that would be 140,000 uh, 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 tons and uh, heavy duty uh, and medium trucking. Even just 5% of the fleet uh, would, be, would be about 300 uh, tons of hydrogen. So we could just set those targets, sit down, think about what kinds of investments and regulatory changes would be needed in order to provide the demand pull to ensure that that hydrogen production level would be achieved. And then we can go around the country and do what we did in Edmonton, uh, successfully incentivizing uh, the production and the use uh, of hydrogen. And, and that would be a way to think about industrial strategy at the national level. But we got to do that sector by sector by sector by sector uh, all across the economy in all of those top opportunity areas uh, that I identified earlier in the talk. Very glad uh, to have uh, such a great audience and I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Well, thanks, Bentley. Uh, lots to uh, lots to unpack there. No shortage of, uh, of actual work uh, to be done. Uh, quite a few questions already uh, starting to brew off to the side and um, you know, I think uh, from from what I can see, I uh, read quickly through them, kind of a mixture of uh, somewhat technical questions, I think, uh, to a degree, I'm going to start a little bit higher up than that. And, um, you know, I think one of the things I've seen that so your you know, your presence presentation spoke to me in many ways, one of the things that uh, I've seen in, in working uh, you know, on the clean tech side for the for the last couple of years, and having read through uh, Canada's net zero, um, you know, by 2050, uh, talks about 60% uh, clean fuel and 40% clean electricity, and uh, you know, which was really an interesting statement and a, and a way to divide, but a very you know broad way to divide into what's going to be required for us to achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, as you run through that, then it becomes a mix of uh, individual roadmaps and strategies on an energy by energy kind of subsector by subsector, I guess, basis. Um, you know, and the, and the challenges, which you've pointed out, is that uh, some of those things uh, tend not to be as specific as they need to be. So what, what types of electricity, what do we need to do to the grid? Um, and, and so to me, uh, you know, within those strategies, there's sort of a, a bit of a miss in that I think the, the larger vision was sort of set out about where we were going, but there wasn't necessarily the divided steps to to actually right. get there. So just thinking through that, uh, you know, I think you've given some some advice already, but specifically to that point, you know, what's your advice to government, you know, given now that they've developed these roadmaps and strategies, 
uh, that they may perceive that that those things are are in place. Um, you know, I think you've touched a little bit on on uh, on some yeah. of it already, but what what's your advice to them now? Yeah, well, I think those are excellent opportunities to kind of say specifically what those high level recommendations really mean in these specific areas. So if you take the hydrogen strategy, for example, you know, there's no concrete quantitative targets laid out in the hydrogen strategy. There are some numbers floated at the end of a very long 170 page document. But just compare that with the Department of Energy hydrogen roadmap, which immediately comes out, lists five priority sectors and provides scoping numbers for how many megatons of, uh, of hydrogen would be needed for each of those sectors. And then immediately says, okay, here's the technology pieces that need to be accomplished in order for that hydrogen demand to be in place by 2050. And then it breaks it down into a sub-target for 2030 based on technologies that are ready to deploy today. So like, there's a very clear strategic quantitative focus in that roadmap and it's only 35 pages. <laughs> so um, it's just it's it's just focus in the delivery of what the strategy is supposed to be on. And the other thing is that the Department of Energy's consultations with industry around the hydrogen roadmap that they've done, um, you know, they do hundreds of consultations with industry a year in each of the sectors that they're deploying roadmaps in. So the industry is already aligned with that roadmap. And the feedback that we've gotten from, from industry partners in the hydrogen strategy, and I'd be interested in folks' perspective on the call, I'm sure a number of them are in the working groups, is that those working groups are, are talking shops or that they're one-way traffic of information from the government to industry. And they're, they're not clearly activated to the goals or to any kind of benchmark. So they're not really working groups in the sense that they're actually trying to build a project pipeline in the way that has been done in the, in, in the Edmonton uh, Hydrogen Hub, where there's a very clear list of priority projects that you know, TA and partners are out working to fund one through five. They're, they, they have six on the go, you know, nine and 13 are already being floated with other funders. And the, like the project pipeline is being actively managed. And that's what the strategy and the collaboration is for. Um, that sense of purpose and coherence and clarity is just not present in, in these in these roadmaps, if that makes sense. So um, I think that using external partners to create roadmaps and then using external pro partners to manage the project pipeline, that that would be a really good thing for the government to do, to, to, to stand up and support independent intermediaries. And it's going to vary by sector, you know, who the appropriate independent intermediary is. In some sectors, there's already something that's ready-made, that's independent, that is trusted on both sides. They can just be appropriated and used. In other places, they have to be spun up, created, funded. Um, it, but you go sector by sector and you figure out who that partner is and what that what that collaboration looks like and what the project pipeline is going to look like. Um, so I can say more about that, but I, I think that that um, the, the government can really think hard about what the goals are in each of these and what the strategic collaboration to deliver on those goals actually looks like. Um, and then at that point, um, at that level of specificity, pro the project pipeline fills itself out, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think you raise a really interesting point there around, um, you know, potential partners into this as well, you know, and you talked about the need for industry and, and government and then, you know, those arms length organizations and associations mm -hmm. to, to really flip in as well. And so, you know, shameless plug for emissions reduction Alberta is that, you know, we have developed a technology roadmap. Um, we've, you know, and, and in order to do that, because we are funders within the system, we needed to have a process by which we understood you know, what we were trying to achieve with those funds. And I think it's, you know, probably the, uh, you know, I've only been with emissions reduction for a month, but when I saw that document, I didn't, I wasn't actually initially aware that it existed. Uh, and, you know, having, having been in the space for a while um, with my time with Prairie Scan, it was interesting to see that there has been level of thought by Prairie Scan and ERA almost independently mm -hmm. putting thought into the structure because, those organizations are tasked with funding and they have mandates by which they have to, to meet. And so, you know, I think all that to say that there is an opportunity here for all of us to collaborate. It doesn't have to be, it's, it sounds very daunting when you talk about it, but there's quite a bit already in place work that's been done, which is maybe further down the funnel. But in a way, I think what we're, what you're calling for is just sort of a, a little bit of a refresh and start again from the top so that we can knit some of these things back together. Am I, that's what I'm hearing from you, basically. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we've focused in the discussion on the process piece, but the vision piece and the leadership piece is really, really important. Um, 
having buy-in from the political level and from the highest levels of industry is really critical and having them both committed to that shared common goal and having a shared vision of what Canada's place in, in the net zero economy really looks like and sitting down and, and restarting from that, I think it is a good place to start. I think one of the problems is that Canada has executed very poorly on process on a number of these things in the last couple of decades. So it creates this like graveyard of bad experiments. And every time you try to say, well, shouldn't we do a cluster approach? Like you said about the hub, people are like, oh, well, there's these five bad clusters. So we can't possibly try a cluster approach again, even though it wasn't done in a successful and an appropriate way in the first place. So we need to get past that and, and just think concretely about how we can how we can use best practices to inform these things that we do know work in other jurisdictions, but that we just didn't get right in, in Canada. Um, but to your point on the technology uh, roadmap that ERA did, you know, I, I really love this document. I, I noticed it um, very early on when I was actually working at an institute called the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which uh, like ERA had a pot of money that it was meant to invest. Um, and I saw it as a really great document for thinking about strategic investment. And that's what the country needs to do. The country needs to think just like the ERA did about, wait, what's our role in the ecosystem? And how do we do strategic investment? And there's a couple of things that really jump out at me about that document. Um, you know, even now, a couple of years since, since I first came across it, the first is that it chose focus areas. It said, look, these are the areas where there are strengths in Alberta's, um, you know, industry and, and clean tech profile. And we're going to focus on those areas and we're going to divide our portfolio into these four focus areas. That's crucial. Again, the clean, the clean growth, the clean fuels fund that just got disseminated today, it invested 80 million, 800 million in 60 projects which means that you've given just enough <laughs> to, 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 to allow 60 projects to fail instead of enough that would allow any of those projects to actually succeed. And they're not built together as packages of like, well, these ones are clearly to do this and these ones are clearly to do this. So everybody knows what is going on. And ERA is a little bit earlier stage than some of the stuff that the federal government should be doing. So it's not exactly analogous, but that focus piece is really clear. The second thing that jumps out at me about that document is is creating a balanced portfolio of investments, knowing that there's technological uncertainty to 2050 and investing appropriately in multiple pathways, but not the ones that we definitely know are not zero compliant and not the ones that we know are never gonna work in the industrial ecosystem that actually already exists in Alberta, but building a portfolio, not so again, not investing in everything, but investing enough in the ones that we know could really benefit us. And I think, you know, there's lots of examples of this, but in fuels, for example, in creating sustainable aviation fuel, you know, there's three or four different chemistry pathways to activate agricultural and forest residues. Well, we probably need deployment in two or three of those right now. And that process of strategically investing in order to catalyze the collective learning that we need to do, I mean, that's what Iostra did. Instead of saying to every uh, oil and gas company, well, could you each pay you know, 10 million to do the same experiment five times? Why don't we just do it once and we'll all watch <laughs> and then we can compete with how to build a business model around the outcome of that experiment. So there's still competition. There's still capitalism, you know, at its best. Um, but we're doing that from a place of collective learning and cooperation on up to a certain point. And I think that that model is really successful and it's kind of embedded in the ERA approach. We're just going to take this project. We're going to show everybody what it looks like. And that I think was really smart and, and, you know, again, a critical role in industrial policies for organizations like ERA to do that. And then the third thing that that, that technology roadmap does that I think there's lots of lessons to be learned from is that it, it, it explicitly said that we're going to go beyond technology as a, as an organization principally charged with investing in technology. It also said, no, 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 we're going to look after the ecosystem. Uh, we're going to think about the ecosystem and we're going to um, make investments in, we're, we're going to make sure that the policies and the regulations that are needed to unlock these technologies in their true real world life are in place. So we're gonna provide that liaising and advocacy function to other bodies of government that need to be brought in in order to activate these technologies. So again, not thinking of that the, that the goal of net zero ends with technological development because it doesn't, that's just the start of it. Getting that technology integrated into a policy infrastructural physical, social landscape, that all that other work is really hard too. And organizations that are funding technology need to take into consideration those broader things and make sure that they're a part of the plan and the strategy uh, from the get-go.
Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that, you know, I think along with the centers of excellence and hubs and clusters yep. and all of the things that are that's going along, I do think government also needs to take a step back on that regulatory and policy piece, because we need centers of excellence to help industry, uh, to help, you know, research and development to go after these areas. But I think government almost also needs to fundamentally say, actually, we need centers of excellence around policy and regulatory frameworks. We need to adjust more quickly to what's happening because we can't, you know, we can't use the same thinking and the same models that we've used in the past. And I think that's a little bit of the outcomes we're seeing around the Clean Fuels Fund potentially that you've talked about is that, you know, maybe that's where some of that that misstep can come from is, is utilizing tools of the past to try to fund where we are today. And we're sort of, we're not connecting on all cylinders yet. I'm going to switch to uh, some some questions from the, the group here. We've got uh, the number one voted for here seems to be uh, from David Lizell. No big surprise there. But uh, uh, it says, uh, what kind of reception are your ideas getting in the federal government? Are the departmental silos and governments uh, one of the key barriers? And if not, what are the barriers? Yeah, I think that um, definitely departmental silos are, are one of the are one of the key barriers, right? Um, it's hard to think about exactly who would own this, right? Um, you might think I said, but actually I said's traditional expertise is just in automotive and in aerospace, and you can think about that that the federal department as being those two things mashed together, and now I said being asked to expand its expertise into all of these other areas that it doesn't have the expertise. And then NRCAN clearly has the expertise in a number of these areas, mining, uh, forestry, oil and gas, clean fuels, um, but doesn't have that industrial policy expertise and doesn't have that history, historic relationship to it. And then of course, TC is involved, Transport Canada. Is involved. So I was saying, I was answering Dave's question. Um, uh, and so, the, but the reception has been really positive, I think. And, and the reception, I think people understand that we need to do this. They understand that the race is on and that they understand that that uh, it makes sense to take a more strategic approach. Um, the, the reservation that I would have would be that I, I worry that the government thinks that it's already doing this. Mm -hmm. and, and one reaction I get a lot is, well, we have the Strategic Innovation Fund. We have the Critical Minerals Fund. Like we have these spending platforms. But you know, big pots of subsidies are not an industrial strategy. At least they're not a smart industrial strategy, right? And so without clear directionality in the sectors, without focus, uh, without goals, uh, without strong platforms for ongoing strategic collaboration, we don't have, we don't have an industrial policy. Yeah. And, and I apologize to everybody for our uh, little, uh, for those of you that have managed to get back in, we apologize for that bit of a disruption there. I think we just had a glitch uh, where we all got uh, booted out. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, and so unfortunately, we've also lost our questions, so I can't go to the next one. But, uh, you know, just picking up on that thread a little bit. Um, you know, it's been I've so I I've had a, a a career both in industry. I spent um you know twenty five ish years in industry in different executive roles, and then now transferred over to some government not for profit kind of roles. And you know now I'm still in government, but a bit of a an arm's length organization. And one of the things I've seen government struggle with is um, the expertise side of things. And I think you touched on that a little bit about how it is. Uh, in in different silos, you know, I wonder if, you know, perhaps the the recommendation out of that is recognizing that, um, you know, some way somehow you need to to bring these these voices to the table, uh, but having that internal expertise, I think, is really important as well, and and making sure that wherever that external expertise actually lives, that it has a really strong voice at the decision making table and i'm i think what what i've often seen happen is that you know the the policy experience comes to the table to develop policy it does listen there is stakeholder engagement and there's things that can happen it's not necessarily those voices at the table it's it's data and words on paper and what did we learn from that to go and and build the policy or the strategy versus actually having them there to to develop it. I don't know if there's some kind of resolution around that. But again, I think, you know, I mentioned around the idea of having policy and regulatory centers of excellence. I think 
you know, those, those bureaucrats also need to really think about, well, what tools are we deploying and how are we deploying it and what can we really do differently moving forward? Oh, you're on mute, Bentley. And I've had good conversations with regulators in the Canadian context that, that suggest precisely this, which is that uh, they, there, there's, I mean, part of it is just that there's a structural tension there, right? Like if the regulator tells everything to the firms, you know, that's a problem. If the firms are talking to their regulator, they're not gonna, they're not gonna provide the best quality information because they don't want the regulator to know exactly what their play is. Um, so you need someone who can either figure it out or who talks enough to everybody to know enough that they can align people behind the scenes. And that's where that independent intermediary comes in. And, and I think that's something that, that, that we haven't tried. And then also I think that the government has been simultaneously too aggressive and then also not aggressive enough, like too aggressive with abstract emissions targets and not aggressive enough with concrete economic targets. And, and in neither case, in, informing those with strong collaboration with industry, right? So I think there's a lot of room to improve everybody's roles and responsibilities here, right? Um, and industry has to come to the table too. And industry also has to do something that they're not always comfortable with, which is just checking their particular business models bottom line in order to allow the industry to get built. Because when you come into a road mapping exercise, and I've been blessed to work with partners that have taken up this attitude, um, you, need, you need to think about building the ecosystem and, and then think your firm is going to benefit from what's best for the ecosystem and not be competitive at the stage of making strategy. Yeah. Make a strategy that everybody knows they can compete on that platform. But when we're making the strategy, step outside of your individual interests, think about what's best for the country, take a Team Canada, Team Alberta, Team Saskatchewan approach. And start from there. And so industry has to make sacrifices too, and they have to do things differently as well. It's not just government that has to learn to do things differently in an in a, in appropriate strategic collaboration. Yeah, that's super important. And actually, that's a phenomenal point because, uh, you know, having been on the industry side, manufacturing side, you know, often the, the tier one, two, and three supply chains are just endless. Um, they're, they're partners that are willing to collaborate to the nth degree. Uh, but sometimes that idea of competition really gets in the way. And, and I think it's good to be competitive and com competition is what drives our markets. All of those things are super important, but I think sometimes we forget a little bit of the magic of when it's right to compete. And sometimes the rising tide, you know, raises all boats. And so if we're there working for the health of our sector, then theoretically, when we use our competitive advantage applied to that, it should actually help us out even more than, you know, trying to be cagey. And, you know, I do get the sense, at least in Alberta, that's where the bulk of my experience is that, you know, companies are are willing to be, uh, you know, fairly honest. And, and uh, uh, I think that uh, there is uh, uh, the willingness, I think, even from government. So you mentioned about government coming a little bit too early and then really aggressively. I, you know, that was actually a really great thing to see because I often feel like our government tends to hedge and, and we're too slow to react. And so we miss the boat on a lot yep. of things. And, you know, and that was one of the things why I say, you know, I feel like in some ways we're slightly ahead because we did some seminal things early that were really, That's you right. know, that put us in a good position. But now everyone's catching up to us. Everybody is now going to deploy. And the US and the Australia and UK and Germany, I mean, these folks do economic development on a level that I don't think we play the same game as they do. You know, I've, I've been to a lot of conferences recently and I keep hearing people say, well, skate to where the puck is going. And I, I actually do think by some of the early things government did, they set that in motion. But the That's second right. part of that that I think is missing is, and this is what I say every time someone says that is, well, you better make sure you're Wayne Gretzky when you get there. <laughs> you know, like, don't just, you know, be there where the puck's there. But if you're some, you know, third string player on a on a single A team, you know, never going to make that. Yeah, and that's great. You got the puck, but you don't have anything to do with it. And I think that's the next step here. And that's really what you're talking about is setting this policy in place will then allow us to hopefully be the Wayne Gretzky we need to be. I, I'd get, settle for dry side on myself. <laughs> I gotta find no, we built we built a really strong clean tech innovation ecosystem in this country. We really have. We've got yeah. no commercialization game plan. We've got no deployment game plan. 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's what Jigger Shaw in the Department of Energy's loan program office, that's what he's building is a commercialization and deployment plan. So he has, you know, $400 billion of loan program authority. So he has a weak tool. All he has is a loan guarantee. That's all he can do is provide risk-free financing, right? So he can make the private sector make deals in given areas. That's pretty much all he can do. Um, but he's matching that with the top expertise coming out of the national labs, coming out of the Department of Energy. Um, and, you know, there's just enough, there's just so much capacity in, in the American economy um, and expertise that you know that that's going to, that's going to crank. Um, but what, okay, so what's our deployment plan? Why are we using a $1.5 billion clean fuels fund that's not aligned with the deployment plan? Like we just, we have to get smart about it like right now. And it has to be on that secondary phase of scale up and deployment, not on the primary, um, you know, technology development phase. Cause I think we did that. Like we have the firms. And if you look down again, uh, I'm not being paid by Tom to say this, but like, if you look down the ERA's list of investments, if you look at what Steve McDonald actually invested in, it's like the all-star hall of fame list of Canadian tech firms like Carbon Cure and, and Svante and like, you know, all of the hits are there, Entercam. And so we have the technology providers. We just have to get them scaled before they get bought by a foreign company. So what's like, the plan? I do like to say that Alberta likes to keep everything we do a secret. And I think government does that as well. And I think ERA is, has been a very, you know, well-kept secret, uh, which hopefully we can, uh, in, in the coming months ahead, you'll see and hear more from us. And uh, I, I recognize we are technically out of time, but we lost a couple of minutes. And I do see that a couple of people have actually made the, the uh, like they made the time to put their question back in. So Anyone who has to go, I appreciate that and appreciate you coming. But if if you're able to hold on for another five or so minutes here, maybe we'll just pose one, a couple more questions to Bentley and, uh, you know, at least get a, a couple of our viewers uh, some satisfaction to hear. So Canada can make blue, green, pink, the whole rainbow of hydrogen. Energy and national unity are tightly linked in Canada. Do political leaders properly recognize that hydrogen could be a national unity thread that could be pulled through all sectors? No, I mean, I think that's what the hydrogen strategy reveals is that there's a disconnect between producing hydrogen and what downstream sectors it needs to be realized in. And I think as soon as you start thinking hard about downstream sectors, you start to think, oh, this makes, this is easy, you know, like the ammonia thing. And I mean, this is one of those examples where the government got out over its skis in announcing a 30% cut to fertilizer without just socializing the idea that we could use, you know, low, low carbon blue hydrogen as a drop-in. And that would probably take care of that whole 30%. Instead, it sounded really scary, like, oh, we're, and so Saskatchewan is having these protests around the concept of a fertilizer ban, which is just demagoguery, effectively, you know, political demagoguery. Um, but but it was an, a self-own in the sense that it's just such a simple techno technology solution, and it could have been used to align agriculture and show agriculture that it has a place in a net zero economy and to show Saskatchewan that it has a place in a net zero economy to show Alberta that it has like, and again with BC's forestry communities it's the same thing they don't see themselves as being in this play but mass timber and biofuels are amazing opportunities so we need to invest in those places where maybe the greenhouse gas emissions reduction is not huge but the the political economy benefit is massive and the national unity benefit as a result is massive uh yeah that i appreciate that uh, so another question here oh and i i recognize so that question was from jacob he uh, he said that the genius police shut you down uh that's why we we had a little gap there i still I, he was not referring to me i think he was referring to me <laughs> right there. Uh, i get to skate off of everybody's brilliance i get to skate off of bentley and era's brilliance well you know everything i'm telling you today i've gotten from really yeah. smart people some of them who are on the call so yeah. I, I myself think of myself as a node in a network rather than yeah. anything Special so you mentioned that the UK does a much better job of coordinating uh, government and industry, uh, and I concur with that. Why, why do you believe we struggle in that regard? For example, do we tend to assess risk in the role of government differently? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I commented on this a little bit, um, but I think that just to speak to the role of government, I think the Canada Growth Fund is really interesting. If you look in the background papers to the Growth Fund that got released with the fall economic statement, some really interesting stuff in there on risk and uncertainty and the role of the Canadian Growth Fund. And what it shows is that the Growth Fund, the government is willing to let the Growth Fund take an equity stake in firms. 
Now that is big and that is interesting. And that's a new way of thinking about the government's role in this transition. And so it's a big win for the, for the folks who have been lobbying for the government to take equity stakes and for the government to take a different risk profile. Um, and I think that the growth fund is, is the start of something new. And the, a real strong example there came from Invedismal Quebec, which did take uh, equity stakes in a lot of the firms that they invested in, in the battery supply chain and in other pieces of the Quebec ecosystem that they wanted to build. So they provided this really excellent um, sub, subnational example that, that now is, is having an effect on, on, on national policy. So I, I do think that we need to do that, but I think the government's coming around on that. I think they really get that, that they have to take on more risk and they have to play a smart and more strategic role uh, in building these supply chains. I do think they understand that. Yeah, and you know, I think there's there's strengths and weaknesses in every organization. Uh, I've worked in government, as I said, there is some amazingly brilliant people in government. Maybe not always in the position they need to be. It's super complex, big organization. You know, lots of water to tread, uh, so it can be difficult to make change. But uh, you know, I think a lot of voices at the table, uh, a lot of willingness to work together. I think government sees that more and more. And I, you know, I. I think they've made some aggressive moves recently. I always think we can up our game, um, you know, but I think we've been willing to look at, do a jurisdictional scan to figure out what others are doing and follow them. I think we actually have the talent and the brains at the table to, to set the path and direction ourselves as well. I think we can step into the light. I think things like the transition accelerator, the hydrogen hub, the, like I said, that's that's my intent with saying we need to lean into those things because we have things that we've done well, and they worked in Canada, they worked in Alberta, and we need to extrapolate that into other, re and there, there are other examples of that as well, that's not the only one, and so, you know, finding a, a new methodology to lead and a new way to gather these folks together, it's not net new, it's, it's actually just learning from what we've already done, and there are a lot of smart people willing to come to the table, we need to lean into that. Um, I am going to ask one more question, uh, and then we will we will cut it off. Uh, you referred to jurisdictional silos. Could you comment on silos related to electricity transmission? Uh, thinking of Ontario, Quebec power trading, uh, under the impression that this is limited by transmission infrastructure, but more importantly, political resistance to unlock opportunities. So some mm -hmm. of that provincial uh, trade issues uh, with trading low carbon electricity, hydrogen aspirations in both provinces maybe uh, be a synergy or maybe another way to ask that question or to think about it as well which is you know would a federal industrial strategy policy then allow the provinces to still compete to a degree would you view that as healthy and would that be the, a better structure rather than trying to figure out how to solve the interprovincial trade but this is obviously an issue we yeah. we're challenged with here yeah, um, Peter Jokotsky is on the call, and he and I had a conversation about a year ago about the importance of Alberta's um, uh, permissive environment for, for, for behind-the-fence electricity. And guess which jurisdiction is installing more renewables than any other jurisdiction in the country, and it's Alberta. And part of it is because you can sidestep the the uh, the utilities and and the, the you know the large um, energy regulators in each of the provinces because those things move slowly and they're very risk averse because they need to be providing power to lots of people and they're very they're very uh, they're very risk averse to doing that and so that is a barrier to national industrial strategy and I love the way you put it Tom that we need to foster competition amongst the provinces and I think. I think once the number, once people realize that there's 10,000 megawatts in the pipeline in Alberta and that that's going to lead to battery factories, refining capacity, and lots of other pieces of the downstream markets getting located in Alberta, then they're going to wake the hell up and they're going to realize they need to allow a PPA or they need to get the, the fire underneath their own electricity providers in order to uh, get more clean energy online. Because we've, take, we've taken our green, clean green for granted, we have. And it's gone now because the IRA uh, gives all the support that basically under the IRA, it's the, the final rules aren't out yet um, in the United States. But but my guess is that you're basically going to be able to buy clean electricity at the marginal rate for, for solar and wind uh, to be installed, which means the cheapest energy in the world you're going to be able to buy electricity for in the United States. And that's going to make the investment case for uh, for every single downstream industry in the energy transition just real locked tight in the United States. And this is the threat that we that we open the conversation with, which is that 
you know, the one major strategic advantage that we had for attracting foreign investment uh, is now gone, then we're back to basically providing wood and minerals and all the processing and manufacturing value added, added will go down south where the IRA can can boost it with the, with those incentives. Um, and, and we're back to being a colonial economy that, that exports uh, wood and, and other primary resources uh, to other places and, and, and doesn't have any manufacturing value added uh, to strengthen our economy, to scale our own firms, to build homegrown capacities, to build true innovation ecosystems, all that stuff stays uh, in other countries. So um, we absolutely have to uh, find a way to, to get the, the electricity grid uh, and, and building out clean power generally back into the conversation in a really serious way. Um, and as for the question of interprovincial collaboration on grids, I just don't, I just don't, I don't get it, <laughs> except that uh, we have to find a way to sidestep it. Yeah, it's just too much of a mess. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it, you know, it's laudable to think to try to fix it. But, you know, so I think that's a perfect ending. You've set the stage uh, perfectly for why uh, this is such an important thing. We've we've highlighted other jurisdictions that are who we're competing with. Set the stage for the fact that we are in a race, and uh, you know much more to come. Uh, lots of opportunity and organizations that are actually very capable to be at the table. Uh, some seminal documents like the technology roadmap and others uh, that are inputs into this industrial strategy. Uh, so that concludes us for today. Thanks, thanks to everyone for attending and sticking with us. For those of you that that jumped back in uh, to hear uh, more of Bentley's comments, special thanks to Bentley, obviously, for joining us and and sharing your your insights. The recording of this webinar will be available, uh, hopefully, in one nice stitched together package, so you you don't have to wait for us to jump back in and uh, should be ready tomorrow on YouTube. Uh, and please join us next month for our December webinar, Pipes versus Power Lines featuring uh, John Wickham of Australia's GPA Engineering. And to stay in the loop about future topics, join our mailing list uh, by visiting erh2.ca. Follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, everybody, for your questions and for, for attending. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great.